So you are redistributing toxins, which is really the main problem. And it means that these toxins can even end up in places that are worse than they started off from. They could end up in the kidney. They could actually be stored inside the cysts, making the cyst fluid more toxic, which will make the cyst grow more. Hello, everybody. This is Felix, your friendly neighborhood kidney hacker. Today, coming back with episode number four on fasting. Why do we recommend fasting in PKD and how do we recommend fasting in PKD? So the usual way we recommend to fast is intermittent fasting. It is not 24, 48, 72 hour water fasting or even dry fasting. Why? Well, the first reason that we recommend fasting is actually because whenever you fast, your body starts to, after some time, go into something called autophagy and it also lowers the amounts of something called mTOR. mTOR is a protein complex that is necessary as a signal for your body to trigger growth. What kind of growth? All kinds of growth. So that means muscle growth, but also tissue repair and also cyst growth. So mTOR is a universal growth signaling molecule. In PKD, we're interested in making our body more focused on using mTOR for the things that we actually want it for. We want to grow muscle, we want to repair organs, but we don't want cyst growth so much. Whenever mTOR is not activated, so when it's low, that is when another process is kicked into gear, which is called autophagy. Autophagy means eating oneself, autophagy, and it means that your body is scouring everywhere that it can for damaged proteins. And these proteins are going to be gobbled up and reused for making other proteins out of their individual constituent parts. Now in PKD, we also have some damaged proteins that are involved in the disease process. And by down-regulating mTOR and up-regulating autophagy, we increase the chance that these damaged proteins are gonna be gobbled up as well. And some of the cyst tissue might also be gobbled up as well. And that is really what we want. The problem is, of course, we can't have autophagy activated all the time because then we will just wither away, lose all our muscle mass while also losing some of the cyst tissue. So that's not an optimal strategy. Instead, we can choose to intermittently inhibit mTOR and activate autophagy, and then also have other times where we do the opposite. And I like to keep those in a two to one ratio, really. So we have twice as much time in autophagy mode than we have in the mTOR activation state, at least as much as we can sort of infer, because in reality, of course, when you stop eating, this is when your body begins to ramp up autophagy processes. But of course, it's not going to have them at 100% immediately. In reality, it probably takes almost the entire amount of time that we are fasting in intermittent fasting to ramp up this process. But still, in that case, you're going to have at least one or two hours that autophagy is really um, activated. If you do this over weeks, months and years, you can strive to have more breakdown of cystic tissue during your fasting window than you have buildup of cystic tissue in your feeding window. We can also control that a little bit more by limiting the amount of growth of this cystic tissue in the feeding window, as we discussed in video number one through ketosis. Now, many people ask if a little bit of fasting is good as intermittent fasting, why shouldn't we fast even longer, 24 hours, 48 hours, for three days or even more? The problem with long-term fasting, water fasting that is, is that your body will break down fat tissue in this fast, which is usually a good thing, right? But this fat tissue then releases stored toxins. So your body will always store toxins in your fat tissue. And that is really where it belongs if the toxins are going to be in your body. Of course, it's better to detox them if you can. When you then release them by force through fasting from your fat tissue, they get into circulation. Now, the next thing that happens is usually they can be 
detoxed by the kidney or the liver, but a large part of them is trying actually to be excreted through the gut. So your body excretes toxins with bile into your gut and there it is waiting to be moved out by the stool. If you don't eat anything, it's just going to stay there and then it's going to be reabsorbed. And now you have the toxin back in your system, but it's not in the fat tissue. It has to find its place first, right? So you are redistributing toxins, which is really the main problem. And it means that these toxins can even end up in places that are worse than they started off from. For example, in the brain, you don't want them to end up in the brain. Also, they could end up in the kidney. They could actually be stored inside the cysts, making the cysts more toxic, making the cyst fluid more toxic, which will make the cysts grow more. We can talk a lot about the cyst fluid in another episode because that is a whole story in itself. It harbors a lot of toxic stuff, so you really don't want to redistribute any toxins that you don't need to redistribute, but you can excrete. So excrete what you can by really keeping the movement in the gut going. Don't even get me started on dry fasting, right? Um, we want to have a certain water intake and PKD to keep the urine osmolality at a certain level, at least. So you always want to have slightly yellowish urine. You don't want it to be transparent, but you also don't want it to be dark. If you're going to be water fasting, then that's not an issue. If you're going to be dry fasting, it's going to get super dark. That is not a great strategy for kidney disease, at least. It might have a lot of benefits in other cases. The body even makes more metabolic water if it's uh, dry fasting. But in kidney disease, this is really not a great strategy. So toxin redistribution is the main problem. We do want that the toxins are excreted. We just don't want them to be reabsorbed in the end. So what can we do about that? multiple day fasting actually can have extra benefits for PKD compared to just intermittent fasting because there's a much longer time frame where you're actually uh, suppressing mTOR and upregulating autophagy. So it is an interesting strategy and I do recommend it to some people, but we got to do it the right way. So Dr. Mercola actually wrote a whole book about this called Keto Fast and I highly recommend you read it if this is something that interests you. But the main gist of the book is that you can have a minimal amount of calories and, of course, bulk from non starchy vegetables moving through your gut that will have the fasting benefits in place while also keeping a little bit of movement in the gut and also supporting detox processes with the right nutrients. Dr. McCullough actually came up with a formula to calculate how many calories you want to eat in your protein fasting and the formula that Dr. McCola came up with for his keto fast, some people might call it protein fast, I like that name better, is 3.5 times your lean body mass in pounds is going to be your calorie intake for your protein fasting day. You also want to keep it under 15 grams of carbs and you also want to keep it under 15 grams of protein. The rest is going to be fat. If that's a little complicated for you, that's no problem because I got you covered. I have a little calculator on my website, uh, reversingpkd.com slash report. It's also in the description. And that will give you your protein fasting day calories for easy reference. How could a multiple day protein fast look? My weight is about 70 kilograms or 154 pounds. If you take that, multiply it by 3.5, then you arrive at around 540 calories for a protein fasting day. I would now plan my lunch, calculate how much carbs, protein, and fat will be in that lunch, and then the remaining calories I will have in my Bulletproof coffee in the morning. So really, you have a Bulletproof coffee that might be a little bit lower fat than you would usually have, and then you have a very precisely calculate lunch. In my case, it's usually a cup of bone broth with about 150 grams of Brussels sprouts or other non-starchy vegetables, making sure that I don't hit the 15 grams of protein and I don't hit the 15 grams of carbs with that meal. And the rest of the calories come from Bulletproof Coffee, as we already addressed. Days like this, you can do a couple in a row and that will really upregulate your fasting mechanisms. It will really upregulate up autophagy and downregulate mTOR. If you notice that you lose weight on these days, if you cannot recover the, the lost weight 
on that day within the coming week, then you should probably increase your collagen intake on the protein fasting day until you only lose as much weight as you can recover until you're gonna do your next fast. So it all depends on how often you wanna do it and how long you wanna do it. I definitely encourage people to do this protein fast as an accelerated way to reduce this growth and even shrink it a little bit. So water fasting, not a great idea. You should not be doing that because you're redistributing your toxins. Intermittent fasting, great idea. If you're gonna do 16, 17, up to 18 hours a day of intermittent fasting, that's great. The higher your cardiovascular fitness, the more efficient your fast is gonna be because your body takes a shorter amount of time to really be in a protein deficit and start looking around at damaged tissues and cells to dissolve really and to remake into new tissues that you are needing. If you're not very fit, it's a great idea to do some of the protein fasts every now and then. You can do it once a week. You could also do it, which is probably even more effective, three or four days on end per month. So you pull all of your protein fasting days together on end, which will make actually mTOR inhibition and autophagy activation even stronger. So that's a great idea. There's also some more supplements that Dr. Mercola recommends for these protein fasting days. Whoever's interested in that should probably get the book Keto Fast. I can only highly recommend it to everybody. I hope I could clear up some of your thoughts on fasting that way. Give us a thumbs up if you're on YouTube or give us a five-star rating if you are on a podcast platform. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, happy healing.